All right, welcome back, everybody. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Um, we're continuing our little adventure into the Swedish M46 sporting rifle, 9.3 by 57, or is it? Okay, in the last video, we cleaned up some pretty rough metal. Basically, out of the guns that we got in, we took the one that had the roughest metal, and we decided to kind of show you guys worst case scenario in terms of like assessing exterior condition and looking at the metal works. Well, we mentioned in the last video that we would have a look at uh, reinforcing the tang on the stock. So what we decided to do was we found an M46 that actually does have a what appears to be the beginning of a crack here in the tang. Um, these guns, because of their thin wrist and heavy recoil, they are um, subject to cracking in the tang area if they're not um, well bedded or in this case just well relieved. We're going to get in here and we're going to relieve this stock and we're also going to be looking uh, at an odd headspace anomaly. We're going to be doing a chamber cast today. So we're going to use some Brownell Sarasafe uh, chamber casting alloy. Uh, we're going to be using some Brownells Acro Glass to get after this task. And uh, we're going to attend to a uh, stock issue. And we're going to do a chamber cast on this particular gun that is eating a 8x57 field gauge without any resistance at all. Okay, normally I would expect it to have at least a bit of resistance, but some of these guns were chambered in 9.3x62. Not many of them. Now this was advertised as a 9.3 by 57, but it could be a 62. Um, the barrels are just marked 9.3. They don't mention if it's a 57, a 62, or whatever. So a few of these M46s were chambered in 9.3 by 62, and since it eats the field gauge, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and we're going to chamber cast this gun. So we're going to go on over a chamber cast today and also checking out this tang. So this is sort of an ongoing uh, video series that we're doing with these little M46s. We will get into some reloading stuff as well, uh, reloading the 9.3 by 57 and converting 8 millimeter brass, uh, necking it up to work with the 9.3 by 57. And also this is going to segue into some hunting. So I hope you guys are enjoying these videos. Let's get after it. Yeah, guys, this one's got me baffled just a little bit, okay? Um, we got a few of these guns in and the 8 by 57 Mauser field gauge um, drops into all these other guns and the bolt does not even begin to close. So the whole idea behind a headspace gauge is that the bolt should not close on the gauge. This field gauge represents a growth in headspace that is definitely unsafe. A field gauge, this is like, unless you're in wartime, <laughs> don't shoot the gun, okay? This is, this is like on the spectrum of being unsafe to fire. If I put this field gauge in this gun, which, by the way, the bolt closed exactly the same on all the other guns. Look at this. It eats it. Not only does it eat it, there's a tiny amount of play in that bolt. And I don't have the trigger mechanism in there, so the, the, the bolt's not cocking. But, I mean, it doesn't even begin to give me any resistance. So that tells me that this could be possibly a 9.3 by 62. This is a 57 gauge. So a 62 being longer, of course it's going to eat the gauge. Now I'm not sure about the shoulder dimensions and the, sh the length of the shoulder and where it sets related to the 9.3 by 57 as it compares to the 9.3 by 62, but we're going to perform a chamber cast and just get an idea. We clean the chamber and we clean the bore really, really well. We're going to plug the bore and go ahead and uh, perform our cast. Now just because this gun eats a gauge doesn't necessarily mean that it's unsafe to fire. What would probably end up happening if this is a 9.3 by 57, then what's going to happen is you would just fire form your brass using a light load or whatever, and then neck size only and just make custom brass for your rifle. Then at which point you could probably go ahead and shoot full power ammo and you would not have a problem because that brass would then be blown out to your specific chamber dimensions. And because you're not working that brass, like resizing that shoulder all the way back down then fire forming it back out, sizing it down, firing it out, you're not repeating that process, the brass will last a lot longer and you're essentially creating custom brass for your rifle. So it doesn't mean this gun is dead in the water, it just means that it's going to work the brass a heck of a lot. And we definitely don't want there to be uh, any bad headspace, okay? So when you fire form that brass, you're creating a new point for that shoulder to headspace off of. And as long as you just neck it down in a, in a neck sizing die, um, it's going to be fine because the bolt is going to be putting pressure and it's going to lock up nice and tight on that shoulder as it's fire formed out to, the, to meet that extra dimension. What we want to know is, is this a 9.3 by 57 or is it a 9.3 by 62? So let's cast this thing and see. 
All right, guys. Uh, what we're trying to basically accomplish is very similar to what we got here. I, I drew a broken case out of a 303 Bren gun barrel, and you can see that it pulled the case, the broken part of the case, right out. And this Sarah safe is a low temperature alloy uh, that does not have a very high melting temp. So this is Brownell Sarah safe. It melts at between 158 and 190 degrees. So you can literally just about heat this stuff up with a hair dryer. Okay. I'm really curious to know what's going on here because this is this is kind of a strange uh, strange thing. You know, I the way that this thing is eating the gauge is, is weird because the barrel is actually in really good condition. The lands and grooves look wonderful. I wouldn't say new, but I mean this gun is probably 70 years old. All right. So you know, I'm not expecting it to be brand new by any any stretch of the imagination. All right, but definitely strange. We're just going to look down in here. We want to cast probably maybe the first quarter inch of rifling too, and that's going to give us a little bit of a, a throat wear measurement. That'll also tell us what size projectile that we want to shoot through this too. A little bit further. Basically just going to shove a patch down in there. Looking at it with a bright light, it does have a little bit of throat wear, but nothing that I would consider to be um, a very big deal. All right. I probably pushed that patch in there a little further than I wanted to, but what this demonstrates is the amount of free bore that we've got. You can see the amount in the throat that the bullet is intended to occupy. These are very long projectiles. Uh, this is a 9.3 by 57 barrel with excessive headspace. Okay. Uh, this is the parent case, which is an 8 by 57, so standard Mauser, and it's necked up to a 366 diameter projectile. And that's where you get the 9.3 from. Uh, 9.3 projectile. And you can see that the shoulder angle is considerably uh, less pronounced on that the 9.3 by 57 as it is the 8 by 57. So we're going to go over this in the hand loading video. Just And remember, like I said, just because this particular gun has a little bit of, of excessive headspace doesn't mean we can't uh, use a fire forming load with like a little, you know, 9mm Makarov projectile wrapped in a little bit of plumber's tape and a little bit of fast pistol powder, you could still anneal and fire form a case for this gun and it would be completely safe to shoot. But just bear in mind, this particular gun ended up having some excessive headspace. So I thought that I would uh, showcase that. You can see the amount of free bore. And then what you can also do is you can take measurements of this just initial throat area. And what that throat wear is going to give you an idea of is how shot out this barrel is, okay? And our measurements determine that the barrel itself is relatively unworn. So it's not really worn out at all. I actually wound up taking about two or three different bolts out of various other guns that I have, the M46s, and testing to see if they would all fail the headspace check. And every single bolt, despite what gun I pull it out of, like a bolt that headspaces normally in another gun, Still headspace is on the sloppy side on this particular gun, which tells me that it is obviously some issue. The hash mark on the bottom of the barrel is undisturbed. The barrel hasn't been unclocked or removed. Uh, there's no weird um, wear on the barrel. The muzzle is really tight. It's just weird, guys. Don't know what to tell you. But I thought that we would showcase this. There's your chamber cast. Let's go ahead and uh, have a look at this stock, and we're going to reinforce the tang and glass this stock in, and I think we'll be pretty much ready to put this particular gun back together. We have another gun that has a roughly fitted recoil pad. We're going to pull that recoil pad off in a future video, and we're going to show you guys, or I should say Ray is going to show you guys, how to fit a recoil pad on your rifle. So that'll be some fun. And then we'll also, in a future video, be going through a little bit of drilling and tapping on the small ring Mauser action. Let's move on. We're going to end up using some Brownells Acre Glass uh, to glass in this tang. It's probably hard to see in the shot here, but there's a few cracks starting to develop both on the left and center of the tang. Um, yeah, that's going to need to be relieved and filled in with glass. 
In another video, what we're probably going to wind up doing is taking some steel bed and bedding some core areas on a few of these stocks that might need it. Um, the recoil lug recesses in the stock are pretty strong, but could probably use, really these stocks could use a metal recoil lug uh, for the recoil lug on the uh, action, but we're going to get in here and clear out just a little bit. I know it's going to be hard for y'all to see what I'm doing because of the angle. I'm left-handed here, but I'm going to try. Just going to relieve that a little bit. We're going to lay the action in and have a look. We want to relieve it a good bit in the tang area because we want to give some area for the glass to actually fill to. Have a steady hand. Be real careful when you're doing this. We've got a bit of relief, but we want a little more, okay? Just a bit. I'm hoping that we can mix in a good bit of this sawdust with the glass to where it'll blend in really well. We're not talking a humongous amount of space here, just a tiny amount. Just take your time, work as you go. Just relieve it. Not a big deal. I'm going to continue to relieve uh, this tang area. Uh, what we did is we got in here and we also bottomed out. Where in the heck is my scribe? We also bottomed out in this area and we undercut it just a little bit so that it performs a mechanical bond operation in there is what we want. So we got in there and we're not done yet because we're still going to get more mechanical bond in there. We are going to look at the tang and make sure that it's equally relieved on all sides of the rear tang. We don't want too much but we do want a little bit of a gap to give the glass somewhere to go. I'm going to bring that in just a bit on this one side and I think we'll be there and then we're going to go in and add some divots uh, so we can form a uh, mechanical bond here, guys. <clears throat> Upon closer inspection, it appears that the crack is really not that deep. It's only gone down to about right here, so I think we're going to be able to stop that before it becomes a problem. And then likewise over here, that's just a tiny surface indention, and it doesn't go very far down at all. So I think we've pretty much stopped uh, the damage before it spreads, and we're going to go in and add some divots so that we can get a good spot to form a mechanical bond. Okay, so I'm not going to use this. Actually, if that cutter was a little bit smaller, I could use the same one. I'm going to swap it out for a slightly smaller one. We're going to take this small ball right here and go in and make ourselves some divots so that the glass has got a uh, mechanical bond to make. Hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing. I'm going to come in from a few different angles here. You can use a drill bit too if you want. It's really not a big deal. It's probably getting a little hot, but it'll be all right. Try to do this right-handed.
All these divots are going to give us a good spot for mechanical bond. They don't have to be terribly deep. Uh, we could probably take a drill bit and get in there a little bit further. For the purposes of what we're trying to do, I think this is probably going to suffice. I might go a little bit deeper in a couple of spots here. I think you guys get the idea and we're going to uh, move on and start dropping some glass. So we've collected some shavings right here. This is a little bit of walnut and this could be arctic birch, but it's probably walnut. But anyway, that's what we got is a bit of uh, whatever this is along with some walnut shavings from earlier. And uh, what we're going to do is go ahead and take some uh, Brownells uh, Acra Release, aerosol release agent. We're going to spray the screws. Really just the only one that's even necessary is the rear screw, the front screw. Just to be safe, we'll hit it, but probably not even going to need that. And then the rear of the tang on the bottom metal. Just in case any of that Acra glass decides to seep down in here, uh, we don't want it forming any kind of weird bond that we can't get out. So... I probably went a little overzealous there, but all right. The rear of the tang of the action. We obviously don't want any mechanical bond here. So we're going to hit that really good anywhere that the glass could flow into. We're just going to be overzealous. Okay. So we got all our metal coated down with release agent. Now what we're going to do is go ahead and fit the bottom metal underneath the stock like this, that in there. And what we will do, this is kind of hard to demonstrate and film. I'm gonna do my best though. We'll go ahead and put the rear action screw in, just so it's, you can sort of see that it's essentially filling up this area so that no glass can get down in there. So all we'll have to do is once we mate the rear tang up with the head of this screw, we'll just carefully start it and since this is already coated in release agent, we should not have a problem with anything seeping down there. And it's going to be a nice, consistent fit. And we'll torque these action screws down to a nice, consistent torque. Our bottom metal looks really nice, so I don't really see any need to bed the bottom metal. Um, really, this is just a reinforcement for the tang. So I'm going to mix up the gel, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, drop her in there and start the uh, screws. All right, we're going to start uh, just mixing this glass together. Again, one part uh, main epoxy to the hardener, one part hardener, four to one ratio. And we're going to mix in our, uh, our wood shavings. And hopefully this is going to match the color pretty good so that you really shouldn't see the repair too bad. Um, this is the way I've always done it. Now you can also take uh, aluminum shavings, metal shavings, uh, if it's you know, an option you want to go, you can add bits of powdered metal in with this as well, uh, if that's something you want to do. All right, that's mixed in really nice. We're going to go ahead and just start dropping a bit unceremoniously. We're going to let it flow. The work time on this stuff is pretty dang decent, okay? So don't sweat it. And the fact that we got a little bit on the stock, it's fine. And the fact that there's some on this screw is not a big deal. We've got it coated in a very liberal dose of release agent. It is not going to be an issue at all. Once that tang pushes down and gets tightened in, it's going to be money. All right. We want to make sure that it gets into all those little divots as best we can. You'd rather have more than you need than not enough of this stuff. It's going to ooze out. We're going to wipe it down. Uh, we've got plenty of work time here, okay? No issue. There's probably people watching this video, and they're looking at this, this screw covered in acrid glass, and they're probably panicking, thinking it's going to get stuck. But trust me, guys, I've done this plenty. It's not going to get stuck. If it gets stuck, your money, you get your money back. That was a joke. I'm going to come in from the bottom here, and we're just going to get this screw tightened down in the front, and then we'll pull the action out carefully. All right, we got our screws torqued back down. Looks like it filled in pretty nice. There's a couple little areas here we want to try to make sure they fill in. Our, our color wound up working out really nice. Hopefully, we won't have created an eyesore here. 
We're gonna let that get down in there real good. Not bad. Let that seep in and then before it uh, cures up, we'll wipe it down off the tang. Just wanna make sure that that glass flows in there. Hopefully we got enough under the tang, hopefully. Our uh, color matching ended up looking real nice. We're gonna let that cure up. And uh, we got most of the surface uh, glass off that was in the way. I think that's gonna fill in just fine and provide us with the uh, bond that we're looking for. And you really just about can't even tell that's not a terrible, terrible little home repair right there. Okay, so we'll let this cure up and then we'll pull it out and have a look, see where we're at. All right, we got the action out of the stock. Uh, we can see that our bedding took just fine. We got all our little divots in here that we put in there. We undercut it a bit. We opened it up a little bit in the back so that our receiver lays in there real nice and flat, the receiver tang. Uh, so that looks good. We added our uh, walnut shavings in with the acro glass to make the color match and I think that uh, wound up looking really nice. I'll just slip this uh, action in here. I don't have this thing super tight in the vise, but I just kind of want y'all to see that, that came in there real nice, made it up real nice. Okay, pull this out. Hopefully I can do it here without... Hold that, yeah, thanks. Okay, so nice tight fit. Um, on the tang area. Another thing that we're probably going to wind up doing, this stock is relatively thin in this area. Uh, there's not much we'll be able to do in this area just because there is so little meat right here. But in this area where the recoil forces are imparted against the stock, you can see a, a pretty distinctive swell right in here. Uh, we probably will wind up relieving this a bit and getting in there with some Brownells uh, steel bed, which is basically like a DEVCON, a two-part uh, metal based epoxy that's pretty gnarly and we'll get in here and we'll bed uh, this area and also the area up here uh, there's a forward stock echelon up here that you may not be able to see but right here we'll get this bedded in we'll probably do that in a separate video uh, we are waiting on some more steel bed to come in and what that's going to do is just provide a really strong surface right here for the recoil forces to be uh, impacted into the stock this is a relatively thin stock especially in the wrist area and the, the sides of the stock relatively thin. So we don't want this to break and we don't want it to split. A lot of military rifles wound up having a metal cross bolt that goes through these stocks to provide basically a recoil bearing surface, uh, repeated firings so it doesn't beat the stock to death. This doesn't have that, it's all just wood. So we are gonna go in here and reinforce this in a future video, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but for now, that's pretty much uh, the, the gist of what we're going to do with this M46 for the day. We will have some other little things coming along that we'll be doing. But guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned something. Definitely a big shout out and thank you to all of our Patreon uh, supporters as well as folks that purchase man cans to help the channel uh, keep going. You guys are awesome. Thank you very much. If you love what you see, if you love the channel, consider uh, donating a few bucks on Patreon or purchasing a man can to help support our efforts. Uh, have a good one. We'll see you next time. Many more videos on Low Husky uh, M46 is on the way. See you soon.